Welcome to Dates and Dead Guys. In this episode, we're going to talk about a complicated figure. Not super complicated, a serial killer by any standard, but one that his community generally approved of and admired, Louis Wetzel. Wetzel was a frontiersman and scout of the northern Ohio River Valley during the late 1700s. If half the stories about Wetzel are true, then he is likely the most prolific Indian killer in the history of our country. Intentional Indian killer. In 1763, the same year Louis Wetzel was born, King George III made a proclamation. In order to preserve Native American lands, settlement was prohibited west of the Appalachian Mountains. The colonists ignored this order almost immediately. In their defense, they wanted to live there really bad. But who wouldn't want to live in modern-day Ohio in West Virginia? The real problem was that the land was already occupied by those pesky Indians. There are numerous tribes out there, but the Shawnee are the ones that are most recognizable. Wetzel's family was among the first to settle in this new frontier around the year 1770. They lived in the town of Wheeling, on the east side of the Ohio River in what is modern-day West Virginia. This little squiggly line is the Ohio River. That river is going to be important because on the east side we have American settlers, on the west side we have the Indians. It's not that simple, but it more or less works out that way in the stories. Conflict between the settlers and Native Americans already existed, but when the American Revolution starts in 1775, things are going to pick up. Most Native American groups side with the British. American settlers were blatantly ignoring claims of land by Natives, and the British were at least promising to protect it. Indian raids in American communities like Wheeling became more common. The town of Wheeling wasn't innocent. They killed several chiefs during this time frame. One chief was called Cornstalk, which is a great Indian name, but they chopped him down in 1778. While Lewis Wetzel is likely 14 years old, the time frame is a little sketchy, he experiences the tension between these two sides firsthand. While working on his family's farm with his younger brother, a group of Indians emerge from the woods. Lewis grabs his father's rifle. He had it with him because there had been raids recently in the area. An Indian raises his own rifle and fires at Lewis. It grazes his breastbone, leaving him bleeding but otherwise okay. The Indians capture Lewis and his brother and take them back across the Ohio River, where for two nights they keep the boys captive. Native American capture was a crapshoot. The boys had no way of knowing if they were going to be adopted into the tribe, if they were going to be tomahawked, or if they were going to be ceremoniously tortured. So after two days, they made a plan for escape. On the second night, while the Indians slept, the boys were bound. Thinking they were too far from home to escape, no Indian bothered to stay on watch. Lewis is able to wiggle out of his ropes and freeze his younger brother. They creep into the woods, but realizing they won't make it far without shoes, Lewis sneaks back into camp to steal some moccasins and grabs his father's rifle while he's there. It takes the boys a few days, but they manage to evade recapture and return home, welcomed basically as celebrities as the community assumed they were gone forever. This event starts to develop Wetzel's dislike for Indians. But as he grows older, his experiences reinforce his hate. And there is a lot of hate. Even before he becomes a scout, he kills a few Indians, most notably when he's 15. While working on his father's farm, some frontiersmen approach him, asking for help because some Indians had stolen the horses. In the process of getting the horses back, Wetzel finds himself treed and alone fighting two Indians. Even though he's young, Wetzel shows he's capable and clever. He uses a stick to hold his hat out from behind a tree and draw their fire. After they shot at the decoy, emptying their rifles, he killed and scalped them both. Throughout his life, Wetzel has a thing for scalps. It's very important for him to be able to prove that he's killed people. The government, on purpose or not, reinforced this behavior, sometimes even offering financial rewards. There was one case where Lewis was even paid $100 in order to kill an Indian, but he gave the money away to a girl he liked so she could buy housekeeping things. To deal with the problem of Indians on the frontier, local militias ask for volunteers to serve as scouts. The job of a scout is simple. Track Indian movements and kill and defend yourself as necessary. Scouts get no pay, and they're not even provided with a gun or powder, but there was nothing that Wetzel wanted to do more. He was active as a scout by the time he was 17. These are the conditions in which Wetzel grew up, on the frontier between Indian territory and what we view as established early America to the east. Wetzel is described as being close to six feet tall and muscular, but his most defining characteristic is his long black hair. Wetzel never cut his hair. As an adult, when it was brushed out, it nearly reached his calves. He kept it this way because he assumed that he would die at the hands of an Indian and wanted his scalp to be worth the effort it would take to kill him. And it would be tough to kill him. Wetzel has extraordinary abilities, but one in particular will make him famous on the frontier. In 1882, Wetzel joined a volunteer militia moving into the Ohio Territory on the Crawford Expedition. The goal was to go into the Ohio Territory and burn native villages to discourage them from attacking American settlements. The expedition was a disaster. The militia was surrounded by Indians, as many as 70 of the 500 men were captured and killed. William Crawford, the leader of the expedition, was tortured and burned at the stake. The survivors scattered. 
Wetzel among them. While returning home, Wetzel is traveling with John Mills, who got his horse stolen by Indians. They find the horse tied to a tree. Wetzel warned Mills not to approach, but he does anyway. Before he gets to the horse, there's a crack of the rifle. Mills is hit in the leg and goes down. Before Wetzel can react, a group of armed Indians step out from where they've been treed. Outnumbered, Wetzel needs to create distance between them and himself. He takes off into the forest, rifle in hand. Before pursuing Wetzel, the Indians use tomahawks to finish Mills. As Wetzel runs, he's keeping an eye on his attackers, four in pursuit. Before going too far, he turns around and fires, killing one. Firing your weapon in the age of the muzzleloader can be dangerous, especially if you have multiple people attacking you. Muzzle loaders can only be shot once, and the process to reload them is not fast. I've even read stories from the time period in which people being attacked intentionally do not fire the rifle. Because when the threat of firing is there, people have a reason to keep their distance. Knowing that Wetzel's rifle is now empty, the other three drop their guns and continue the chase with the tomahawks, hoping to be able to move faster without their rifles. But since Wetzel was a child, he had worked on developing an unusual skill, reloading on the run. Just as Wetzel readies his rifle, an attacker catches up to him. He turns, and the Indian grabs his rifle. Wrestling it back, Wetzel fires directly into the Indian's chest, leaving him dead. Wetzel takes off, with two more still in the chase. The attackers are more cautious now, unsure how Wetzel was able to fire. They hang back, but still chase. Wetzel again reloads on the move, and after finding a good spot, turns as the Indians must pass a clearing. He fires, killing a third. Bewildered, the fourth stops his attack and runs off. Wetzel hears him yell, No catch that man. His gun always loaded. Wetzel collects the scalps of the three dead Indians and returns home. This trick, reloading on the run, is going to make Wetzel legendary on the frontier. Almost no one could do this, but it's common stories about it. It's demonstrated pretty well in a scene from Last of the Mohicans by Daniel Day-Lewis' character. Loading a flintlock is a complicated, multi-step process. It's possible in order to pull off the trick, Wetzel used a smaller, unpatched shot and slammed the butt of his rifle on the ground in order to pack the gunpowder. This would make it so he wouldn't have to use the ramrod. But a smaller caliber and unpacked shot would make the rifling of the gun useless and he would not be able to hit anything from any real range. This story more or less supports the idea. Wetzel waits for the Indians to be right on top of him before he fires. Not a good time for a misfire, you know, while being chased by people with tomahawks. He's also said to have maybe kept spare bullets in his mouth. Bullets are made of lead. Definitely not good for your sanity, but you can judge for yourself whether or not Wetzel was crazy. This, for a while, fighting Indians is Wetzel's life. He lives as a scout. There are plenty of early examples of Wetzel being barbarous toward Native Americans, but things got worse after 1786. While in a canoe on the Ohio River with his father, brothers, and a dog, the group is attacked by Indians along the riverbank. His father, John, brother, George, and dog, who is rudely not named in the sources, are all shot and killed as Wetzel and his remaining brother escape. In the same year, his sister Christina is killed in a raid. The timeline on Wetzel is murky, and that's mostly because a lot of the letters about him come from long after he died. Some letters even outright say they're not sure when certain events took place. But it seems that between 1786 and 1791, when Wetzel is in his mid-20s and three of his family are killed, and dog, this is where he goes from being a frontier scout and Indian terrorist. There are a number of examples of unprovoked killings. Wetzel seemingly hunts Native Americans for sport. In one story, on the west side of the Ohio River, he finds three Indians on a hunting trip. Wetzel, famous for his patience, waits for them to sleep. He sneaks into their camp and murders two with the blade. The third wakes and escapes into the woods. Lewis Bonnet wrote a story describing what Wetzel told her about the trip. He said Lewis described the trip as poor because there were three Indians and he only got two. In another instance, while traveling with a man named Jonathan Zane, the two spot five Indians near the town of Wheeling. This is on the east side of the river. It could be the case that the Indians were conducting a raid themselves. Regardless, Wetzel and Zane track and kill all five. No questions asked, but five scalps collected. Many frontiersmen were brutal, but Lewis Wetzel was unique. Simon Kenton, another man among the most famous Indian fighters, once expressed regret over tomahawking a Shawnee warrior he had overpowered. Kenton said, quote, He was in my power, and I need not have done it. End quote. Wetzel never expressed regret. He probably would have been confused if you expressed displeasure with the killing to begin with. James P. Pierce writes of Wetzel, quote, Between 1779 and 1788, he collected the scalps of 27 Indians that he said he personally killed. Accounts of his exploits, as told by others, put the total at more than 100, end quote. Wetzel lives until 1808, but we know that a rifle he received in 1788 had over 20 notches made in the stock, 
Presumably, those notches represent kills. If those are true, it's not unreasonable to think the total number of Indians he kills is closer to 50, and it may even be much higher. But he only really faced consequences for it once. In modern-day Marietta, Ohio, at Fort Harmer in 1788, Wetzel was down there helping build the fort. Josiah Harmer was the man in charge. He knows Wetzel's reputation as an Indian killer, and before peace talks with a Seneca chief named Tegunta, Harmer meets with Wetzel to make it clear that he is not to interfere. In the conversation, Harmer demands that no Indian shall be killed by men working for him. Any enemy natives should be captured if possible. Harmer says to Wetzel, I do not intend to have my project for peace set aside by one murderous man. Wetzel responds, murderous? That's a hard word, General. Lewis Wetzel never committed murder. Apparently, Lewis Wetzel talked in the third person. He is described as not speaking particularly well, but to be fair, he did prefer the company of dogs to people, which is at least one way that he's relatable. To the comment about never committing murder, Harmer asks, what do you call murder? Wetzel says, again, in the third person, killing Indians is not murder. Peace or no peace, Lewis Wetzel had better be left alone. Why? asked Harmer. Wetzel says, you will find out. Harmer almost immediately finds out. When Tegunta comes to the fort, Wetzel hides along the road and shoots him and then scalps him. But Tegunta doesn't die right away, and he's able to give a description of his attacker. He mentions his long black hair and his angry temperament. And then everyone in the fort is pretty much like, oh, he was loose. Wetzel is arrested, but he quickly escapes from jail. But General Harmer doesn't forget about the murder. For years, there's an active warrant for Wetzel's arrest, but it's mostly ignored. Quick side note, this version of events may not be completely accurate, but it's pretty close. I found an article from a museum in Ohio that suggested that Tegunta didn't die. In a letter wrote by Harmer complaining about Wessel to Henry Knox, addresses Tegunta as if he's still alive. So it's not super clear. Maybe Wessel missed his shot or Tegunta survived the scalping. You can actually survive a scalping, but I don't know if you'd want to. Maybe just wear a hat. After escaping jail, Wessel returns to Wheeling and just kind of continues to do what he normally does. He hunts and kills Indians. Eventually, Harmer's men catch up to him. Apparently, six soldiers jump him in a bar, which is kind of fun, like a little backcountry wrestling match. It should be around 1790, give or take a year. Wetzel is put on trial, and not surprisingly, he expresses zero remorse for his crime. Formally accused of the murder of Tegunta, a judge asks Wetzel, are you guilty or not guilty? And Wetzel replies, I killed an Indian. That is my crime. The response demonstrates where Wetzel is in terms of his beliefs. To him, killing a Native American is not really a crime. He doesn't really view them as people, but instead kind of just views them as the enemy. After the trial, the judge sentences Wetzel to death by hanging, which, for murder, or at the very least a very rude scalping, makes sense. But before that can happen, over 200 local frontiersmen gather to show support for Wetzel. They literally threaten to attack the fort and free Wetzel by force if necessary. Needing support from the local population, Harmer agrees to release Wetzel, and the charges against him are dropped. It's said that Wetzel returns to Wheeling so that he could be among friends, and so, quote, he could engage in his regular Indian hunting at his pleasure, end quote. So, not a lot of lessons learned. Wetzel is clearly a murderer, but he has a lot of support from the local population, and for good reason, at least from their perspective. Demonizing him for Indian murder makes perfect sense. But this is a time period where there is conflict between Indian populations trying to hold on to their land and Western settlers trying to take it. It's a blood feud. Yours hurt mine, so now mine will hurt yours. The institutions out here are not effective. There is minimal law in courts, and the ones that do exist are definitely not fair to Native Americans. When fair arbitration of abuses is not an option, one side is going to lash out and a cycle of violence is going to begin. It's just people handling their own business because there are no police to call. We don't live in that world today. Make all the arguments you want about whether or not Americans should have been settling to the West. It doesn't matter. They were there. When that's the case, you create an environment where having someone like Wetzel on your side is important. Overland campaigns, like the previously mentioned Crawford expedition, or future ones led by Harmer or other military leaders, will result in the deaths of hundreds of American soldiers. And a lot of these campaigns are straight evil. They indiscriminately go in the backcountry to burn Indian villages and, in effect, kill tons of innocent people. When they fail, we don't feel bad. But for settlers on the frontier, Native American raids are common, with Indians stealing horses, kidnapping people, even murdering them. There are countless stories where Lewis Wetzel is the one that intervenes. Time after time, he crosses the Ohio River and rescues people. He retrieves property, and he racks up scalps in the process. 
He was terrifying to Indians. They absolutely knew who he was. There's even a name that Native Americans had for him that translates to Deathwind. It's probably not about flatulence. In a biography about Wetzel, author C.B. Allman writes, quote, It is not astonishing that the settlers were not too particular about the fine points when methods of warfare were considered. Wetzel fought with the Indians according to his own rules and won, while the army fought according to army rule and lost, end quote. Wetzel even had a cave on the east side of the Ohio River near an Indian path. It was concealed, and he would use the cave as a way to attack Indian men and to kidnap women and children. But he did have a code. As much as he murdered men, he never hurt women and children. Except for one white woman that he shot. It was raining, and an Indian had captured her. Uh, he took her bonnet because it was raining and he was protecting his head, and Wetzel thought the Indian was her and she was the Indian. He got them mixed up. Oops. Wetzel would regularly capture Native American women and children. He would take them to the authorities, and they would be able to exchange them for people that Indian raiders had captured. I am positive that a lot of the stories about Wetzel are myth, or at least exaggerated. Some of the stories may even be falsely attributed to him. But Wetzel was effective, and as much as our modern sensibilities want to look at his actions and the actions of other frontiersmen as being monstrous, for people who are out there settling, it's not surprising that they were happy to have someone like him around. Frontier writer Jim Cornelius writes, quote, the frontier society in which Wetzel grew up considered the killing of Indians a public service, akin to the extirpation of wolves and other apex predators, end quote. And that's how they saw it. There's a Native American perspective that cannot be ignored, but if we experienced what the settlers on the frontier had, I'm not sure that we would be better. Let's take this story home. A little while after he's released from jail, Wetzel decides to get away from the Ohio Territory. He went to New Orleans and got himself in some trouble for counterfeiting. He served two years in jails, although he was probably innocent, of this crime. Definitely not the murders. Wetzel couldn't read and write and had little use for money. He bartered and traded services and goods for things he needed all his life. He likely traded with an unscrupulous individual and was left holding the fake money, not knowing any better. When he gets out of jail, he will eventually return to Wheeling, but into his 30s and 40s he softens. In the late 1790s and early 1800s, the conflict with Native Americans and settlers died down quite a bit in the Ohio River Valley. He decides to leave Wheeling, telling a longtime love interest, Lydia Boggs, quote, I don't think I'm needed here at Wheeling any longer. Since the new civilization has come about, the Indians are so peaceful and quiet that killing them would be nothing short of murder. There's some growth. That's good. He continues. They have gotten fiercer and wilder further west. But I shall not go there. I'm getting too old. End quote. In 1808, when Wetzel is 44, he dies of yellow fever while visiting his cousin in Mississippi. He was buried there as he lived, long black hair intact, and next to his rifle. Mm -hmm.